Hello my beautiful watchers, you know that thing that video essayists do where they start their presentation with something seemingly irrelevant to the title and you're momentarily confused but assume it's going to make sense later and it usually does? In 2011, 13-year-old Rebecca Black performed in a music video titled Friday. Due to a combination of cringy lyrics, excessive auto-tune, and general low quality in everything except production value, the video quickly went viral on YouTube and social media as people delighted in mocking its awfulness and directed others to it so they could do the same. The fourth video I ever uploaded to YouTube was a meaningless sketch where I drank a lot of Red Bull, danced to the Lord of the Rings remix song They're Taking the Hobbits to Isengard, and occasionally cut to me reacting to and mocking Friday. I jumped on the bandwagon, made fun of the popular bad thing, and moved on with my life. Eight years later, I was mildly perplexed to hear that Rebecca Black was performing again and that she seemed to be finding an appreciative audience. Shortly later, I watched a video on the subject by Sarah Z. Z? 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 You know, I think I've been in America for so long I've forgotten which one of these is right and which one would be a betrayal of my countrymen to say. Anyway, Sarah laid out the details of the story behind Rebecca Black's Friday, that this young lady had been the victim of a predatory producer and company that made bad music videos and allowed the child performing the song to take all the social media backlash while they collected all the ad revenue from it going viral. And backlash there had been. Black had been forced to drop out of public school due to the constant bullying she had received from being the Friday girl. For years and years no one had let her move on from this one slightly cringy thing she had done as a teenager, vastly changing the course of her young life. I felt like shit for my small but existent participation in the angry mob that tried to tear this poor girl's life apart. Fortunately, it does appear that Black has successfully put Friday mostly behind her and reclaimed her voice, starting her own YouTube channel and producing her own songs that she has taken on tour to, as I said, an appreciative audience. Her attitude on social media seems to be one of newfound empowerment. So happy and ending there, but I was still heartbroken and ashamed of what I had done, thought and said, and swore an oath to never take part in bullying behaviour again, no matter how fun, trendy or tempting it is to do so. Enter the Eye of Argon. The Eye of Argon by Jim Tice originally appeared in the 10th issue of Osfan, a science fiction magazine, in 1970. It is generally considered to be either the worst or at least one of the worst fantasy books ever written. For the last couple of decades, live readings of this book have been a source of entertainment, ad writing, and literary theme conventions. Performances have been organised to recreate passages and highlight just how silly they look and sound. Games have been invented to see if people can get through entire chapters without laughing or can read the original text while resisting the urge to intentionally or automatically correct for the spelling and grammatical errors. And don't get me wrong, the thesis of this video is not that the book is not bad, it is just as bad as everyone says. Tice falls into every last bad writing trope there is and invents some new ones of his own. The story is a cliched adolescent fantasy about a mighty barbarian travelling fantasy lands and using his bulging muscles to defeat his foes and bed comely winches. Tice also continuously uses words in slightly the wrong context, rendering the sentence nonsensical and suggesting that he was using a thesaurus to increase his vocabulary without fully understanding the true meaning of the words he was choosing. Everything is overwordy and overdescribed, sequential sentences will contradict each other, the story is at best a meandering ramble, and there are indeed a lot of spelling and grammatical errors in the original draft. The book fell under my radar a little while ago after I realised that reviews of terrible books tended to be very successful for me because y'all love to see me exasperated, and The Eye of Argon tended to top every so bad its funny book list I found online, making it a prime target. I even went as far as to order my own copy of the book, noting at the time that it was a little strange that the author didn't appear to have anything to do with distributing it. My concerns began when I started doing my customary research into the book's backstory and immediately started getting Friday-related alarm bells going off in my head. Let me start at the beginning and hopefully you'll see it too. I should admit though that the sources I've been drawing from and researching for this video were a little bit sparse and I don't think always fully verified themselves. Because this was a pre-internet event that's not super well known outside of literary circles, I didn't have a huge amount of coverage to work with, and let's face it, I'm not an investigative journalist, so despite my best efforts, it's possible that there are some unintentional, glaring factual errors in this video that I can only apologise for. Tice was 16 years old when his novelette was published in Osfan. Three issues later, they also published an interview with him where he talked about his story. Tice comes off as pretty chill and humble about the whole thing, acknowledging that his book was 
was pretty badly structured and in general wasn't great due to his lack of writing experience, but he seemed really excited and proud that his first ever book was published in any capacity. Not long after that, a copy of his story found its way to science fiction author Thomas N. Scorcher, who was so delighted by its awfulness, he sent it to another author, Chelsea Quinn Yarbrough, who was also highly amused, keeping her copy for years so she could loan it out to friends. Her then-husband, Don Simpson, eventually made a meticulous copy of the text, which was later digitised as home computers started becoming more common. The text was eventually printed, then later reprinted in chapbook form by Hypatia Press, who failed to credit Tice as the author. The company admitted that they had not consulted with Tice before any of these publishings, and had omitted his name in the vain hope that he would not become aware of it and try to stop them. As a result, the book gained even more widespread notoriety as being the worst thing ever written, but for a while was assumed to either be a joke or an unclaimed anonymous work before it was eventually reattributed to Tice. In 1984, Tice was interviewed on a Californian radio talk show, and it became immediately apparent that the constant mockery of his work had taken a pretty serious toll on him emotionally. Now deeply embarrassed by his story, all passion for writing was gone for him, and he claims he intends to never write anything else ever again. He also mentions that he's been struggling in his personal life due to constant bullying he'd received from being the Eye of Argon guy. For years and years, no one had let him move on from this one slightly cringy thing he had done as a teenager. I would love to say that Tice's story has an equally happy ending to Black's, but unfortunately, as far as I can see, he never did write anything ever again, and he never will, because he died in 2002, aged 48. Copies of The Eye of Argon continued to circulate for a few more years until what had been its missing ending was discovered and the first paperback copy of the complete story was published by John Betancourt of Wildside Press. Various other copies popped up occasionally, claiming to be truer replications of the original text with all its errors and hand-drawn illustrations in the margins. The fun and games at the book's expense continue to this day at various events and in the newly emerged booktube community. The comparison to Friday isn't perfect as the pre-internet backlash that Jim Tice received was drip-fed to him over decades, while Rebecca Black got hers all at once, but you see how everyone's glee at both projects' incompetence came at a price for the creators. The thing that actually makes Tice's story slightly more horrifying to me was the utter lack of consent or agency granted to him in regards to the distribution of his work. I also couldn't find any evidence that suggested he made any money from the various printings of his novelette. Like I said, The Eye of Argon is bad, but it's not excessively so by today's standards. I mean, I could go to Wattpad, Reddit, or numerous fanfiction forums and find something on par with this in less than five minutes. Some of Jenny Nicholson's best videos are based on her doing exactly that. It seems somewhat unfair to me that this was deemed the worst fantasy book ever, considering the author doesn't appear to have ever had any intention of turning it into a book. I want to make it clear that this is not a call-out video for anyone who has taken part in this decades-long mockery of the Eye of Argon. Part of the reason I made my Friday-related confession at the start was to show I am not the sinless one throwing the first stone here. So bad it's good media brings genuine joy to people, and in other circumstances that is a wonderful thing. The problem is we sometimes forget that the people who make these things are human beings, and the fun that we have at their expense can have drastic negative effects on them. The fact that this was the work of a minor makes it even more tragic to me. I see the Eye of Argon as a rare pre-internet example of something that's becoming increasingly common now, where doing something cringy as a child or teen can end up haunting you forever. Would Tice have gone on to become a great writer? I mean, who knows, but I don't see the Eye of Argon as evidence that that's impossible. Some authors have natural talents, some are late bloomers, and some get better slowly over time with lots of hard work and practice until they can put out some pretty solid work that people enjoy. The fact that he actually started, finished, and submitted his story to a magazine puts him ahead of thousands of other wannabe authors of any age in my books. Honestly though, I think that's almost irrelevant because the 17-year-old that was interviewed sounded like writing was making him happy, and the adult that we heard from later sounded like he'd love nothing more than the impossible dream of the whole thing just going away. People took that youthful eagerness for the craft away from him with their laughter, and that just kind of sucks. Sometimes we get lucky with our so bad it's funny media, and we're gifted a Tommy Wiseau who is so disconnected from reality they take all the negativity in stride and use it to their advantage, or someone like E.L. James who is so arrogant about their horrible damaging work that you don't feel like you have to worry about trashing it. But sometimes people get hurt, and you don't find out about it until much too late. You can end up with situations like Tice's, or 
Like when the actor who played Jar Jar Binks was almost driven to suicide from all the backlash against him. You could make the argument that in this case there's no more harm that can be done. The author is no longer with us, so there's no more feelings to be hurt, no more dreams to squash. Why not have some fun with this book? And while that's not a completely illogical line of thought, thanks to my opening ramble you now know about my oath of no intentional bullying ever again, so I am going to have to sit this one out. So yeah, The Eye of Argon, a pretty terrible short story written by a first-time teenage author that ended up spiralling well out of his control and spreading around the world, bringing mirth and merriment to thousands, but crushing the dreams of its creator. I dearly hope that Tice found satisfaction and happiness in his life in some avenue that wasn't writing, and... Well, here's hoping one day I find a book equally as bad with a less depressing backstory so we can all enjoy it guilt-free. Thank you for joining me, my beautiful watchers. Do remember that, unlike certain unlucky authors, I would like my work to become widespread, and the best way for you to help with that is to leave an algorithm-pleasing like, comment, and mention my awesomeness on the social medias. If you're new to my channel and enjoyed this party-pooping ramble, do consider giving that subscribe button the old clickeroo. I hope you have a most pleasant day, and I will see you soon. It's Friday, Friday, gotta get down on Friday. Much love and appreciation to my patrons of honor, Shelby Holtz and Sam Cucinotta. Get Friday, Friday, getting down on Friday. Everybody's looking forward to the weekend party and party and... Hello again, my beautiful watchers. I just wanted to take this opportunity to give you a quick reminder that there's a wonderful website called Patreon that's been allowing online producers to actually make a living doing what they do, since apparently YouTube's decided that they shouldn't anymore. Basically, they offer the chance to pledge a certain amount of money per month or per video in exchange for various rewards offered by the creator. There's a variety of stuff you can earn by becoming one of my patrons, including early access to all videos and taking part in that survey you see at the start of every Lost in Adaptation episode. That's actually a very important part of the process, as I use it to gauge how much I'm going to need to explain about the book and the film before I start comparing them. If you decide to become a higher level contributor, your name will be added to the credits that you're seeing right now, and you'll be given the option to join my private chat room so you can regularly talk with me and other patrons. If you're keen enough to join the topmost tier of patronage, you'll earn the most coveted of all the rewards, the chance to pick a future adaptation to be reviewed by yours truly. However, if right now you are thinking, my goodness the Dom, I can't do that! The Llama King will not allow it! The Llama King sees all! The Llama King cannot be opposed! The Llama King is everything! Fear not, it would still be a huge help to me if you were to give that like button the old clickeroo, share this episode on social media with perhaps a little recommendation to your friends to check it out, and subscribe if you've not already. It really helps my channel grow and reach new beautiful watchers. I hope you have a most pleasant day, and I will see you in the next episode. Terrible books tend to be very successful because y'all love to see me exacerbated. Exasperated. And let's face it, I'm not an investigative journal- investigative- investig- ooh. Boy, okay. Mm -hmm. hmm. Just notice there's a Ghostbusters uh, poster back there. The, the friend I'm visiting at the moment has excellent taste in movies. That magazine might be pronounced OS fan, but I uh, oh, can't seem to find anything about it. It's so bad. Is my hair okay? My hair's always okay. I'm beautiful. It's becoming increasingly common now where. Oh, my tea is ready.